You know, the idea of a pitch is, you know, suppose you, you bump into Aliko Dangote, or somebody tells you he's going to be here, he's Africa's richest man, okay? And you're going to walk between here and the door. And you have to say something to him about your business that's going to make him stop and say, say that again. What is it that you will say in your pitch? If you have plans, if you want to run around in a village somewhere, fine, you just might get away with it. But the long arm of international enforcement guys, okay, if you have a hope to be big and to build a big business, start now. Okay? Plate clean. It is the headwinds, the macro, what we call the macroeconomic headwinds that we face in our economies, okay? But that's part of what you have to train yourself as a super athlete to deal with. Because you have to train yourself like a super athlete. This entrepreneurship is not for sissies. Strive Masiwa, Africa's 10th richest man telecoms mogul and a very very soft-spoken businessman from the southern african nation of zimbabwe he has been of course the subject of many of my videos on this channel which so many people have watched and today we're bringing you the top 10 rules for success for strive masiwa which are especially tailored for african entrepreneurs these rules have been picked very well from the talks that he has done in his town hall series of the afripreneur series which he has done town halls in uganda in Kenya and in Botswana and today we're bringing you the top 10 rules that have come from this sort of series that Strife Masiwa has done. We start of course with rule number one which is know your numbers. How many here follow soccer, know the rules of soccer? Most of you, right? So if I say I came in here and I said, you know, oh I was watching football last night just before I went to bed and Manchester City don't like Manchester City. Me too. <laughs> I'm only kidding. But so, so I said, okay, Manchester City were winning 9-1. You would say, uh, was that soccer? <laughs> the number. Well, if I came in, I said, no, the score was 18-1. You'd say, no, 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 that, that wasn't soccer. Okay. In other words, you have such an understanding of the game that you know the numbers. Yes, it can, it can happen. Uh, you know, I remember when old Zaire was beat 9-1 or something by Yugoslavia, but some of you weren't born. Uh, we ran away. Uh, but you, you know numbers. Business must be numbers. The entrepreneur must always function in numbers. Make numbers your best friend. Okay? And know when you see a number that this number, number doesn't, doesn't make sense. sense. Nine times out of ten I read stuff in our newspapers where they're not numerate numbers. They're not grasping the significance of numbers that you know. And no one shouts and screams to say, how, how can you say that? Uh, so let's go back to numbers. Africa's mean age, I'm going to post something on this in a couple of weeks. The mean age, which is, which is actually a better statistic, mean is half 19 years old. Half the population of this continent are under 19. Okay? Amazing, isn't it? So... It's a lot of young people. But what that statistic is also telling us in terms of the demographics is that the population of this continent will move from circa 1.2 billion to about 4 billion in the, in the lifetime of a lot of people that are actually in this room. I think 2050 is the year we're in, looking at. We're talking at, about turn of the century. Some yeah. of you will still be alive. Okay. Surprised? Yeah, because also one of the most fascinating statistics 
that's also driving through at the moment, Africa has the fastest growing life expectancy. We're actually living longer than we've ever lived. <laughs> and you are going to live longer. A child born today in, in Africa who escapes the first five years and has reasonable nutrition could live to 100 easily. In fact, certainly in the Western countries, any child born today will cross 100 unless it was an accident or, or conflict or, you know, that sort of thing. So we are going to live longer. But if we say that our demographics are saying that by the turn of this century, there'll be four billion Africans. A country like Uganda will easily be 150 million plus. Your population. Kampala today will be bigger than Lagos. Okay? They, they, will, be, they will be cities in Uganda at the turn of this century there'll be at least half a dozen cities the size of Nairobi today. Okay? So there's a, it's, the urbanization is unstoppable. Okay? Now, but it also means people will still... The, the one thing we all agree on is we all eat. Okay? So the market for food... Let's, let's drop the word agriculture. Let's talk about food. The food value chain. Nestle. Anybody know the company Nestle? What do they do? Okay. Some Swiss guy, some Swiss farmer, started to make cheese with milk. Because you make cheese with milk, right? I understand. I've never made any. Today, Nestle's market cap is, someone Google it for me, maybe 250 billion euro? 240, 250 billion euro? Okay. If it were a country, it would be number three in Africa. Started with milk. Food. Two? 286 billion euro. Okay? Swiss francs. Which is almost like a euro. So that is, in dollars, it means they're somewhere 300 plus billion dollars. Well, only Nigeria and South Africa and Egypt have a GDP bigger than that company with milk. Strive says there are three things that entrepreneurs need to take care of as they are starting up and running their businesses. People, product, and process. And of these three, as you are growing your business, Strive says process is the most important. The idea of having processes set up within your business and respecting them is what will propel you to success. And so for rule number two, Strive says become a master at process. I... When, when we talk in our conversations on my Facebook platform, I talk of three things. The, the three P's. People, product, people, process. The, these are the three pillars of successful business. <clears throat> process, how do you... I was reading this morning about a company in China that is now a coffee, company, a coffee shop. This guy has built this coffee shop in 18 months to be bigger than Starbucks in China. In, and he's already listing on the New York Stock Exchange and it's worth almost $3 billion. How do, how do you move from a coffee shop to a global enterprise? Uh, what, what, what is, we talk often of IP and intellectual property and so forth, but tell me, is anybody here who can't make a hamburger? 
So how did McDonald's become, I don't know, what are they, 30, 40 billion dollar company making hamburgers? It's a hamburger, whatever, whether you call it Big Mac, whatever, it's a hamburger, okay? <laughs> Can anybody fry chicken? Kentucky Fried Chicken. How do you make a global business out of frying a piece of chicken? It's called process. It's, it's, it's putting together the scale. This is when you are thinking about the people that build up a business. So, for example, I had to go to Nigeria. You've got to arrive, try big country, 150 million people, but it's process. So the entrepreneur isn't just about an idea. It's that ability to build a process, a machinery around your business that makes it scale. So you've got to, you've got to master process at home. You've got to have respect for institutional frameworks. We talk about the rule of law, but even in an organization, okay, I've got to decide, you know what? I gave my CFO certain authority, and that includes overruling me on financial matters, <laughs> okay? It's part of process, okay? So these are the things that you as entrepreneurs, as you prepare to tackle Africa, you've got to become masters of process. Okay, how do you build the uh, structures, the systems that can make a business grow quickly without losing money, without, this is what we're talking about us. Rule number three, find a great co-founder. I've been talking of late about the co-founder. Okay. You are starting out as an entrepreneur and you have a great idea. It's agree it's going to work, it's going to be a great business, but now you have to build it. Okay? When you've been in business for a while like myself, it's a lot easier because you can, you can go and compete for the best people. I just met Sheila, where's Sheila? Get up, Sheila. <laughs> this is an amazing executive in our group. She is just out of this world, okay? She fights for licenses and she gets regulators and so, and, and, and then, and then every now and again, her reports gets escalated and lands on my desk. And I say, go, Sheila, go. Go, Sheila, go. Thank you, Sheila. You see, it's about people, okay? Finding good people. And good people function at their best when they're trusted. You know, you, does it mean things won't go wrong? Oh, they will and they sometimes go really badly, okay? And, but, in what I found over time is yes, we have to have good systems, but you know, the best systems can't stop a criminal. Can't stop the best criminals. <laughs> so you better relax. Don't put everybody in jail, okay? Just because you want to stop the guy, you won't be able to stop, okay? So we, what we try to do is to build around the systems, okay? So you have your systems of reports and, and uh, structures within which you are reporting. And so we know we can pick up that something is not quite right here. This needs to be looked at, and that's why you've got to be investing in IT systems, information systems that are ensuring the flow of information. But when you are starting out in business, what you gotta do, how are you going to get a Sheila to work for you? 
okay? You will have to use other currency, okay? Uh, which may be making them a partner in the business, making them a shareholder in the business, okay? So that's how we, we try to recruit the higher talent. But the higher talent must come in to complement what you cannot do. So I gave the example the other day, but when I started Econet, I had been running the business, I had been in business for six years. If you talk to anybody in Harare, I was a hot shot, I was doing pretty well. I had been industrialist of the year, youngest ever. Businessman of the year, youngest ever, had 700 employees. I thought I knew how to raise money. Then I went to the bank, I said, I want to start a telephone company. They said, okay, let's see the business plan. It said, $10 million. This is 1993. The most I'd ever raised was 300,000. So, I listened to my chief finance officer at the time, bless him. He had no clue either. So I went to find somebody I knew could do it. And I said, okay, come and work for me. I'll make you negotiate it with him for weeks. You can have 10% of the company if you can raise this for me. He raised the money, got his 10%. What more can I say? He, he, he did something I couldn't do. You have to look for people constantly around you to help you do what you cannot do. For rule number four, you might not be able to know everything that's happening minute to the detail in your business. You might not be able to know the granular details of the sales and the marketing, but you should be able to pitch your business should an investor show up, should a private equity fund show up to want to buy your business or to want to buy a share of it or to want to invest in your business as the way of giving you more capital so that you can grow. And so for this rule, Strive says, become a master at pitching your business. Let me go to my pitch, Mr. President, mm. and then I'll let him you know, the idea of a pitch is, you know, suppose you, you bump into Aliko Dangote, or somebody tells you he's going to be here, he's Africa's richest man, okay? And you're going to walk between here and the door. And you have to say something to him about your business that's going to make him stop and say, say that again. What is it that you will say in your pitch? The, the two key principles in a pitch. First of all, you must do your research. You must understand your own product and the thing that you do so well that you could pack it in two minutes and say everything that you ever need to say. Okay? And you must understand the person who's going to receive it. Okay? So well that you know they are going to stop. Okay? So it's, it's about a win-win. Okay, it's not so much about you. What's the, what does it, the investor want? The inv and you've got to understand what the, who the investor is. The investor is not a donor. It's not your grandmother. Okay? He, he may find what comes out of what you do beneficial, but that's not what's driving the investor's approach to things. And sometimes the investors themselves, and most investors you will run into, they themselves have done a pitch to get the money they've got, they want to invest in you. Okay? They go to a pension fund, and they say, you know, if you give me $100 million of your money, I will give you a rate of return of 21% on this money, or whatever it is they're going to offer. Okay? So they're focused on the return they have to deliver. 
You've got to know what is the return they have to deliver. And if you go to him and you say, no, I've got something that's going to give you 50% return, he will speed up and walk away because he will know you don't have it. But if you come in and say, you know, I'm at 19%, so, oh, okay. So tell me how you get to 21. <laughs> <laughs> because there's an honesty in what you are saying and it's something that you can defend, even if you know you could get to 30. Okay? So and you, the, the, there is trying to get that balance. Okay? So it's important to understand that you will be making a pitch all your entrepreneurial life. Number one. Number two, money. You will be looking for money all your entrepreneurial life. So get used to it. It's a skill that you have to acquire. Okay? I had to raise $300 million to pay MTN to buy them out of Mascom. How many know that? Well, I had to do some pitches, okay? <laughs> okay. You have to. It's part of the game. So don't keep beating on about the money. The money will come. Just keep working your skill around your pitch, making sure you're pitching to the right people, and making sure you understand what they want and what are the risks that you present to them that you need to lower. Rule number five, learn the art of networking. How do I get an audience in a big company? You have to be creative about it. Okay. Um, obviously, if you're a small entrepreneur, don't always try to get to the CEO or the chairman of the group. Okay? Do some research on the organization. To, before you ever try and see an organization, do some research. Who, who is the person who really is making the decision on the issue that I'm interested in? Okay? Simply writing and emailing the chairman or the CEO you will be surprised that it's somebody young just like you who ultimately is the person who you need to get to. Okay? So that's one. Secondly, network much more effectively. Be, uh, attend things like conferences, industry conferences, anything, because that's where you meet these guys of, of God, even the big guys, by just making sure if there's any conference in Botswana, pitch up. If you hear, register yourself for every business association there is, if you can get in, <laughs> get in. Because that's when you're going to find the chairman walking in the corridor and you can have a chat with him. So these are just little tips for you, but there are no, no easy answers. But be as entrepreneurial concerning that as you can. Rule number six, learn to trust other entrepreneurs. Stop looking upwards, but focus on looking sideways. In, in building any of my businesses, I never went out in look, looking for some big player. I never went to look for Vodafone or, or MTN or any of these guys. I was always about reaching out to the people around me that I needed to help me build my business. Okay? Uh, now, that's not to say it's a hard and fast rule. But pay a lot more attention to the passionate young guy sitting next to you. By that I include the young girl too. Okay? Sometimes they're better than the young guys. Uh, so. So that is critical to the way I always approached it. But of course, there are always strategic uh, relationships. Remember, I, I, I built for some of you who need to go back to a teaching I did on what I used to call the circle of trust. That trust is so fundamental as a currency. It is a bigger currency than money. Occasionally, there are some thick reports that come out, whether from the World Bank, the African Development Bank, 
the IMF or even from your own country's Minister of Finance that sort of try to look at the macroeconomic headwinds, try and look at things like inflation, like GDP, like unemployment, where business opportunities will be. These reports come out, people pass them around, nobody reads 250 pages because we left it that in school and we don't want to read them. But Strive Masiwa says, if you are to be a great entrepreneur, you need to be able to understand what's in these reports. You need to be able to understand where the growth is going to be within the economy. And so, if you want to succeed as an entrepreneur, Strive says, follow the macroeconomic news. You know, there's an expression that says, Africa is high maintenance. Because we have a lot of headwinds on our continent. Okay, I, I pray that the headwinds that you have to deal with are not going to be as great as the ones I had to deal with. But let me tell you, weaknesses of our currencies is a headwind. An entrepreneur in, the, in Silicon Valley does not have to think, what's my money worth? <laughs> Devaluations, okay? Uh, inflation, interest rates, all these, they're part of the development matrix. Okay, and so you have to uh, be aware of them, fortify yourself towards them. Actually, in Africa, let me tell you, competition isn't the greatest challenge we have. Okay, it is the headwinds, the macro, what we call the macroeconomic headwinds that we face in our economies. Okay, but that's part of what you have to train yourself as a super athlete to deal with. Because you have to train yourself like a super athlete. This entrepreneurship is not for sissies. Rule number eight, be optimistic. Listen, I'm 58. I'm not that old. But I'm old enough to remember China. I would watch on TV millions of bicycles with their little gray suits. They all look like Mao. Look at them today. And it wasn't 25 years ago. We're going to do it much shorter. Okay? These great cities you see, Chicago, to less than 150 years ago, not much better than Kibera, some parts of them. Just go read your history. You know, so people have forgotten. There were once slums in London. Oh, yes. I, I remember as a student in London, there were par in parts I couldn't go to. They cleaned them up. Okay? So let's not look at it and say, we're not going to do it. Because we will. The path to the future is never a linear, a linear line. It's only a linear line when we measure backwards. It does that. Okay? And then we say to that point, and then we say, ah, oh, we started here. So it now looks like we did that. But we didn't go that way. One thing that Strive Masiwa has really been known for is really the idea that he has fought against corruption, not only in many countries which he has refused to name, but specifically in Nigeria, where a governor ended up being jailed. And so Strife Masiwa says, if you want to end up being a mogul one day, if you want to end up being a great businessman one day, you have to be able to resist corruption from the start. Rule number nine, avoid corruption. I'll give one story. You know, I was very interested in buying a particular business. And I got a friend of mine in that country, I won't mention the country, doesn't matter. And he said, you know, come on over. I'll, I'll organize for you to meet with the minister. And everything will be approved. So I flew in. We're in this hotel. Minister says, okay, comes in. Very impressive guy. We have a great chat and everything else. And he's, you know, conversation went incredibly well. He says, yeah, 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 no, with you, it'll be done. He says, my price is $3 million. And he pushed a piece of paper to me. I thought, is this real? 
Does this actually happen? <laughs> he says, um, the bank details are there. Just transfer the money, you'll have your license next week. What would you have done? It was incredibly lucrative. What would you have done? It was an incredibly lucrative deal. It was right there. We had spent months on this. Months and months on this. And I'm looking at a guy and he's sitting like you're sitting there. And I'm sitting there and I'm embarrassed. But for him. Okay. I'm embarrassed for him. I think, I mean, to serve your country, your, the privilege to be called minister, to serve your country, and you reduce it to this? That's what was going through my mind. I, I, I had a, a combination of indignation, then I felt pity. I thanked him. I didn't say anything. I said, I'll get back to you. I went to the airport, and I was gone. End of story, out of mind, forgot. I don't know what he does now. <laughs> okay? You can walk away. You can absolutely walk away. Choice. It's a choice you make. It really is. Okay? You tell our people that work for us, you do that, you're on your own. I'll cut you loose. But there have been times, by the way, and some of you know, uh, the story in Nigeria. Okay? Guy said, there's governor of the state. He said, four and a half million dollars or you get out of here. With your company, with your people. And he had the power to do it. I had to up 200 of my people and walk out of that investment. I wrote the letter and then I waited, and a big international company arrived and took my place, took our place. And because they, were, they had American shareholders, I mind telling you, I wrote the letter to the US Justice Department. I said, well, they asked me for four and a half. I'm just asking, did they pay? <laughs> and they did pay. Seriously, got into trouble. It's well documented. And those ones, they don't play. The US Justice Department, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act was triggered. That company, had to leave, they were fined. Big international company, they were fined. Directors were fired. All the employees involved were fired. Then everybody thought it was over. That governor, when he left office, went on a visit to Dubai. In the middle of the night, knock, 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 Interpol. 13 years in a London prison. Served it. Today you don't play in that space. Okay? If you have plans, if you want to run around in a village somewhere, fine. You just might get away with it. But the long arm of international enforcement guys, okay, if you have a hope to be big and to build a big business, start now. Okay, play it clean. Rule number 10, which is something that has been echoed by other entrepreneurs like Simba Moriro and Patrice Motsebe, who I've covered in earlier videos on this channel, look at challenges and see them as opportunities. Which, look at the challenges that you face as opportunities. I think it's the Chinese that find themselves in the use of the same word. Because in your challenge over the cost of electricity, there is an entrepreneurial opportunity for somebody. Mm. Even in what you may see as bureaucracy, 
There are still entrepreneurial opportunities emerging as a result of those challenges. So never feel frustrated because of some of the challenges you face. You just look at it as a step that you have to, to climb. Thank you so much for watching. Now please let me know of any great co-founders that you know of, of businesses on the African continent. Great partners we have started as together and are still together running big businesses because they have trusted in their partnerships and they were great co-founders. Also, if you know of any source which is great of macroeconomic news that you use that you recommend to me and to others, be sure to also leave it in the comments below so that we can generate a discussion and we'll be able to see where we can really get the great macroeconomic news and get the great inspiration also from great co-founders who are on the African continent. And if you have an entrepreneur who you want me to channel and cover next, if you want me to redirect them, my energy and shine a light on a certain entrepreneur, a lion or a lioness of Africa, be sure to also leave it in the comments below and let me know what you think so that next time I'll bring up a top 10 or top 5 series on them. And until next time, my name is Maro.